this is on purpose. They are purposely being misled. And it, it goes back to the um, late 60s, I would say. The kinds of things that MMT uh, is known for saying, I think was pretty common knowledge at the end of World War II. If you go back and say, look at war finance, if you look at the television advertisements of the time, if you look at the campaigns to get uh, Americans and British uh, to buy the government's bonds, patriotic saving. It was well understood the government didn't need the money. It was well understood that the reason you sold those bonds was to get consumers to spend less. Why did you want them to spend less? To release resources for the war effort. So in other words, they understood the government can buy all the resources. It can outbid the private sector but you'll get inflation. We, in, in every war before World War II, uh, we and everybody else always got very high inflation. Why? Because the government just spent more money. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I finally got an economist with me to talk about modern monetary theory. This is a subject that I wanted to discuss for a long time, and I'm excited to have Professor Larry Randall Ray with me, who wrote an entire textbook on it called Modern Money Theory, a Primer on Macroeconomics for Sovereign Monetary Systems. Dr. Ray is a professor of economics at Bard College and senior scholar at the Levy Economics Institute. Professor Ray, thank you very much for coming online today. Glad to be here. Um, Professor Ray, MMT in a nutshell, and can you explain to us a little bit what it is and how it is different from the standard neoclassical model that most students these days still learn when they take uh, Micro 101 and Macro 101, um, just as a brief introduction to this? Okay, so uh, modern money theory, we'll just say MMT because most people know it by that. Um, MMT uh, is looking very specifically at the monetary systems in countries that have their own sovereign currency. And so uh, what we mean by that is countries that come up with their own money of account so in the United States, we have the dollar, Britain has the pound, and so on. So they have what we say their own currency. A currency is used in, in many different ways. But um, so I'm talking about the US dollar is our money unit. And then governments also issue what we also call currency, and that is the paper money and the coins. Okay. And so it's used in both of those senses. Um, and most countries do this. They have their own money account and they issue their own currency. The second point is that um, if a government issues debt, uh, in addition to issuing currency, such as government bonds, in the US we have US treasuries, sometimes they're called notes, sometimes bills, um, and, other, and bonds, depending on the, the length to maturity. So if they issue their own debt, they issue it in their own currency. That's important. So the United States government does not issue bonds in UK pounds. However, there are many countries that do issue debt in foreign currency. And we argue that all the things that we make claims about uh, for sovereign currency nations will not apply 100% to countries that issue debt in foreign currencies. Um, and then uh, the, the governments also impose obligations. In the old days, it mostly was fees and fines. Today, it's mostly taxes uh, in their own currency, and they accept their own currency in payment of those taxes. And again, in the United States, you use US dollars to pay your taxes if you go way back in time, 
up to about 1840, the United States government actually took foreign currency and payment of taxes. But we don't do that anymore. And most countries don't do that. Okay. So if you meet those qualifications, we say that you have a sovereign currency. And then the, the claims that we make about these would apply. The most important one, the most controversial one, I guess, but I think the most obvious one is you cannot run out of your own money. If you create your own money, you cannot run out of it. Okay? And so we argue the U.S. government cannot run out of U.S. dollars. They can always issue more. Now, in the old days, when we said issuing dollars, we actually meant you run the printing press and you print up paper money, you stamp that says this is $1 on it. Uh, that's how they actually made their payments. Today, modern governments don't spend that way. Okay? And so we can go into detail how modern governments spend. But uh, it's no longer printing the money, but they are creating money every time they spend a dollar. Okay? It takes a different form, mostly electronic now. But they create money every time they spend. They can't run out of money. So that's the most important point. You know, the, the reason I wanted to talk to you is that modern mon MMT makes a lot of sense. And I usually do international relations. And in international relations, um, realism is the kind of school that tries just to analyze how stuff functions. And to me, MMT is the equivalent of that in, in the economic world because you try... MMT tries to look at how money is actually circulated, created, and how it interconnects with politics. Um, the standard neoclassical model tries to not look at that at all, uh, pretends it's a given, and then talks about demand and supply in order to explain anything and everything, and the things it cannot explain, <laughs> it then usually makes up some funny uh, money multiplier or other ideas. Um, but the why... Is it that MMT at the moment is not a mainstream way of teaching at, at, at universities about how the monetary system works? I mean, is my in, in, uh, interpretation correct that MMT is still a, um, a minor school of thought within the economics profession? Um, so let, let me back up to um, 1996. Um, so that's when we started this project the MMT project. And um, so what the textbooks tell you is the government collects taxes, gets money, and then spends it. Okay. And that's what most people believe. The government is waiting for that tax revenue to come in so that it can finally spend. And we knew that that is not correct. Okay. Uh, without even looking at how governments really spend, we knew it couldn't be correct because we came out of a Keynesian macroeconomic tradition. Um, and so here I would have to get deeply into the theory so we can just skip, but let me just say, we knew that that wasn't right. Said, so, you know, what are the operations that government goes through in order to spend? We know that it is not that they take in money and then spend that. OK, so how is it that they are creating the money that they spend just around? And I think I can uh, honestly say no economist had any idea how the government actually spent. And so we started going into the deeply into the details um, to see how they spent. And so that was the first step. Let's look at the actual operations involved in government spending, okay? And to, to, to just state it very succinctly, what happens is that the central bank actually makes the payments for the treasury. That's how it's done. And they make those payments electronically by crediting a private bank's reserves. And then the private banks credit the demand deposit of the recipient of the government spending. So if you're getting Social Security retirement checks, you deposit them in your account. What happens is the bank sends those on, the checks on to the Fed. Fed credits the bank's reserves and the bank credits your bank deposit. That's how the government spends. 
Okay, so it starts from the central bank creating reserves. That's how the uh, the government spends. But you know, within the concepts, there are a lot of concepts uh, in the social world of how we think of of things, and some of them are poorly named, and some of them are very very badly named. And to me, the reserves of the Fed is an example for an extremely poorly named concept. Because when we think of reserves, we think of something that you accumulate and have in the background. But that's not what it is, is it? Could you could you tell me what reserves in the in for the federal uh, uh, for the Fed is? Yeah, well, yeah, the, so this goes back historically, uh, to the time when banks actually would keep some Bank of England notes in their vault as a reserve. So if you came in and say, hey, I don't want uh, this uh, country bank's paper money, okay, that I received in payment, I want to convert that to Bank of England notes. I trust the Bank of England more than I trust this little bank out in the country. So they had some of those on reserve. Okay, so that's where the term uh, comes from. They actually had a reserve of those. Today, the reserves take the form of a deposit account that every private bank has at your central bank. So in the case of the United States, all the banks have accounts at the Federal Reserve Bank. And so we still use that term reserve. In fact, Federal Reserve Bank, reserve, uh, there's a deposit account that is at the um, thread. And these are just electronic entries, just like your deposit account at your bank is only an electronic entry. It has no existence except it's an electronic entry. It is your asset. Your demand deposit is your asset. The demand deposit is your bank's liability. What do they owe you? Okay. They owe you the right uh, to draw down that by having them make a payment for you. So your private bank makes payments for you. Okay, you write a check or, or um, you can make an electronic payment. The bank must make the payment for you. As long as it's legitimate, you actually have a deposit at the account or an overdraft facility. They must make the payment for you. This is exactly what the central bank does for the treasury. The central bank makes a payment for the treasury, just like your bank makes a payment for you. Where does the money come from? The banks create all the deposits. So your bank created your deposit. The central bank creates the treasury's deposit. Uh, so... There, what I'm saying is there's a, uh, you know, an analogy that private banks do for you what the central bank does for your treasury. Okay, so there's nothing mystical, magical about this. Your private bank cannot run out of deposits any more than the Federal Reserve can run out of deposits for the treasury because they can always create them. Now, they might not be willing to do it for you, okay? But they always could do it for you. How do they do it? We call making a loan. They can always make a loan to you or let you run an overdraft, which is the same thing. And the treasury can always run an overdraft at the central bank as long as it's within the rules of operation. The essential insight that MMT provides, at least to me, was that you cannot have money in the in the sense that we use it today in, in today's world without also having debt. The two go hand in hand privately, the two go hand in hand for the state, and they interlink in very important ways. And the other word that's so uh, misunderstood is sovereign debt, because we use this idea that so the debt of the net of the state of the country of the state is equivalent to the to to our debt that we have in everyday life and that is a pretty misguided picture isn't it yes because uh private entities uh can always be forced into default on their debt 
while the um, government cannot be forced into involuntary default. Now, you know that in the United States, we have this debt limit that the... the Which we just Treasury had the other up. day. Yeah. Yes. So we go up against that. Uh, and the the Treasury, if Congress will not get its act together and raise that debt limit, then the Treasury may be prohibited from making payments that it easily could do, but will not be allowed to do because of this debt limit that the Congress has put on the Treasury. Now, that would be a, a vol, I would call that a voluntary default because Congress voluntarily decided to force the government to default. So voluntary defaults can occur. They're extremely rare because it's stupid policy. Uh, it makes you, you know, not credible. It makes your government debt not credible. So countries don't uh, do this very often. Uh, but involuntary default is literally impossible. It would be impossible for the U.S. Treasury to not be able to make the payment because it's made by the central bank, the Fed, and the Fed cannot run out of its own liabilities. Because it created itself, it creates its own. It's, it creates its own asset. It's the only institution uh, that's that is not true. Banks are also allowed to do that, but it's only few institutions are allowed to do this. So it uh, is actually, a political. Yeah, but think about it. Can you run out of I, your own IOUs? No, I can always no. write more. You can always write more, and so can they. The difference is that the bank's IOUs are widely accepted, and yours are not. The, the central bank's IOUs are even more widely accepted than bank IOUs. So that's the difference. Anyone can write IOU, $5, uh, but um, you can't always get them accepted. The, 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 the difficult thing to wrap your head around is that we think that all debt at some point needs to pay be paid back. And when we hear that the U.S. Uh, government owes, what is it at the moment? Uh, how many trillions at the moment? Oh, in, in 30, 32 trillion, somewhere uh, around there. Which is a stupid measure to start with. But um, when we hear that, then it makes us feel anxious. And the, the, the mainstream narrative is it that it's future generations that will have to pay back today's overspending. <laughs> Can you talk about this a little bit? Well, first, uh, U.S. government debt has only been paid back one time in one year. That was 1837. We have never paid back the debt since then. Now, there are periods where we run uh, a budget surplus. Those are very rare. When you're running a surplus, you're actually retiring some debt. When any time, if you run a balanced budget, the, the quantity of debt outstanding remains the same. If you run a deficit, the quantity of debt outstanding will be increasing. If you run a surplus, the quantity of debt outstanding will be declining because when bonds come due, say a five-year bond comes due, they don't renew it. They don't roll over into another five-year bond. That only happens if you're running a surplus. So we do have times. They've been very brief. We've only had seven periods where we ran budget surpluses um, and were able to retire some of the debt. Otherwise, the debt has grown every single year since 1789. So it's simply not true that you have to pay back the debt. Our uh, debt to GDP ratio, it's not just that the debt is growing, it's growing faster than GDP by almost 2% per year since 1789. So it grows faster than our economy grows. And it's been doing it for over 200 years. And I always think, you know, almost 250 years. If something can go on for 250 years, it probably can go on a few more years. Okay. Now, do you have, does the government ever have to repay the debt? No, it doesn't. What it has to do when, if you're holding a five year bond and it comes due and you demand payment, they'll pay you. That's it. Okay. But they will issue another five year because there are plenty of people who want more government bonds. The, the bond market is always oversubscribed. In other words, the lucky people get to buy them. The unlucky people walk away without a bond. 
So there's always more people who want to buy them than there are bonds being sold. I mean, he, from the theoretical point of view, it's not even that difficult to wrap your head around the idea that in a growing economy, you have growing demand for more money that will be spent on more things, right? So naturally, that would that would go up. But the thing is, the the national debt is kind of a mirror image of the economy growing because, and you make that point in your book, and it's very important to know that uh, public debt is private assets. Can you maybe talk about this just briefly? Right. So m when most people say money, they, they are thinking of their um, deposit account at the bank and the paper money and the coins. Um, and generally that does grow with the size of the economy. So we can say the money supply typically grows with the economy. Uh, government bonds are more like a savings account. So that is the savings that is growing. And yes, as the country gets richer and richer, people generally want their saving to go up. And government bonds are the safest asset in, um, in any of the rich developed countries. The safest asset you can own is your government's debt. Safer than okay. gold? Yes, gold, gold's value goes up, it goes down. It's probably always gonna be worth something but you don't know what it's going to be worth. The government bonds, uh, they uh, if you hold a maturity, they never go down in value. Now, when the interest rates change, the value of a bond uh, will change uh, in inversely. So when the interest rate goes up, the value you could get to sell your bond right now before maturity will go down if the interest rate goes up. But if you hold them to maturity, you will get the money the government promised. And meanwhile, you will always get interest on it. So that's why people buy government bonds. They are risk-free in terms of default and the promised money will always come. Now, there is the, the capital risk, which means as interest rates change, if you decided to sell your bond before maturity, its price could go up, it could go down. The, um, there are instances, though, um, maybe just to add to this, I live in Japan and it is so interesting that people have been predicting Japan's uh, collapse for like 20 years now because Japan's government debt is the largest in the world and it keeps growing and growing and growing and Japan doesn't collapse because exactly this, it can't, it prints its own money. But there are instances when, when governments go into uh, default and we have Argentina notoriously and we had the example of Greece um why do why does it happen to those countries well these uh, are always or with one exception uh they are foreign currency denominated debt and so if you're argentina and you issue us dollar denominated debt you have to get a hold of dollars to make those payments so that's the difference they they can't simply uh, print up dollars. Uh, they've got to earn the dollars, usually through exports or borrowing. You go to the IMF, say, I need dollars to cover my debt payments on U.S. dollar-denominated debt. You go to the IMF. And the IMF says, well, the only way you can do that is to downsize your government sector, lay off your workers, bust your labor unions, uh, and increase your unemployment rate, then we'll lend you some dollars. So they say, well, you know, on those terms, we're not going to do it. We're going to default. So that happens. Um, but uh, countries that issue their own currency and their uh, bonds in their own currency don't default. Yeah. And Greece was, of course, uh, indebted in euros, which is not their own sovereign currency. Yeah, um, we... We, we were warning, uh, well, Wynne Godley, who was at the Levy Institute with me, uh, was warning, I think his first first article was 1992, uh, warning uh, the UK, do not join the euro. It's giving up your own currency and you will lose the, the sovereign power uh, and you will become like other borrowers. Anyway, it turns out he was right. So we were warning all along that this could happen. And... Uh, uh, they decided to make an example of Greece. 
if you if you don't follow our rules, then uh, you will be punished. Now, eventually, you know that the ECB decided that that was a bad strategy. And Draghi said, whatever it takes from now on, we won't let that happen unless it turns out later, unless you're Romania, then maybe it will happen to you. Uh, so the ECB always had the ability to protect any member nation. And probably they won't allow something like Greece to happen again. A question, a real question I have that I don't understand, though, is why is it that sovereign states don't print other sovereign states' currencies? Or why is it not possible that, let's say, uh, Switzerland suddenly starts printing US dollars, as in not printing as in stamping them, but as in like just digital entries? <laughs> they could, I mean, the, the Swiss Central Bank could open a spreadsheet and call it USD and just enter them there and then trade them, right? Why not? But you you need to be able to convert in order to ensure that your so-called dollars are worth the same as U.S. dollars. So ultimately, you have to be able to convert them. So uh, Ecuador uh, issues dollars, and they are um, the equivalent of U.S. dollars. And both of those circulate within Ecuador. But Ecuador has to maintain a reserve of U.S. dollars to ensure that they don't get a run out of Ecuadorian dollars into U.S. dollars and a demand to convert all of those. So th that's why it's not. In fact, uh, countries do do this um, and uh, private banks in Europe do this too. They, they have dollar demand deposit accounts. They make dollar mortgage loans. Uh, they did a lot of that before the great uh, financial crisis. And uh, when when the Fed had to step into the financial system to save the U.S. financial system, they also saved the global financial system by providing dollars to uh, central banks in uh, European countries, in um, South Korea, in Japan, that had issued dollar denominated accounts because they had to cover the, those promises of being able to deliver dollars. So the, the Fed eventually spent and lent $29 trillion to save the global financial system uh, at the end of the global financial crisis. And about 40% of all of that was outside the United States because there was so much dollar denominated debt issued by uh, foreign banks. So you can do it. But when, when push comes to shove, you actually have to be able to get a hold of those dollars. So the principal problem is that if somebody who's not the United States uh, government in the form of the Fed issues US dollar um, deposit accounts or whatever it is, it's basically doing its own mini currency that then other banks still need to be willing to to accept this payment. And if they don't, then it 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 collapses. It doesn't work, right? Is yeah, the, 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 the Fed has to be the central bank mm -hmm. for all of the the global dollar system in order to prevent those from collapsing. And and the Fed showed that it would do that. Um, and you know what is this out of the goodness of the heart of Americans? No. It's because uh, the the dollar is the international reserve currency. And to keep that status, you have to believe the Fed will do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the Fed showed that it would do it. And so the dollar remains the international reserve currency. What if the Fed had not done it? Who knows? Another currency might have come forward to replace the dollar around the world. There is one more really, really interesting institution in this entire pyramid of um, of of the uh, the balance sheets among among the banks, and that's the Bank for International Settlement, which at which a lot of central banks have uh, accounts. Does the BIS 
have a structural role in the global monetary system? Yeah, it, it does. I told you, I, I don't really do international. And um, other than the, the rules that are agreed upon, uh, I don't know much about its operations. Okay. Um, and f but for the for the national level, um, if the idea is often that that the government can run run out of money, and we already talked about this, but and and we the U.S. just again averted a shutdown because it made a political decision to avert it <laughs> to raise the 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 debt ceiling. But um, this I, I think this is believed. I think people believe that this government debt is a bad thing and they want to avoid it. Um, at the same time, we have central bankers at the Fed and we have especially investment bankers and so on. People who actually make money with money, they need to understand the mechanics and they do. Um, but the general public still thinks of government debt as something bad. Um, the, how do you think in, in, in the population in general, how well is it understood how the monetary system actually works? Oh, it's not, it's definitely not understood. Um, and I think to a, a, a larger extent than you probably would have thought, this is on purpose. They are purposely being misled. And it, it goes back to the um, late 60s, I would say. The kinds of things that MMT uh, is known for saying I think was pretty common knowledge at the end of World War II. If you go back and say, look at war finance, if you look at the television advertisements of the time, if you look at the campaigns to get uh, Americans and British uh, to buy the government's bonds, patriotic saving, it was well understood the government didn't need the money. It was well understood that the reason you sold those bonds was to get consumers to spend less. Why did you want them to spend less? To release resources for the war effort. So in other words, they understood the government can buy all the resources. It can outbid the private sector, but you'll get inflation. We, in, in every war before World War II, uh, we and everybody else always got very high inflation. Why? Because the government just spent more money uh, and bid the prices up so that it could devote those to the war effort. So you always got high inflation. All of our high inflations were associated with wars. That was very typical. And it happened in World War I. For the United States, World War I wasn't a, a big war. So it wasn't as bad for us as it was for Britain. So Keynes wrote, a, John Maynard Keynes wrote a little pamphlet, How to Pay for the War. And he emphasizes, he's not talking about where do you find the money. He's talking about how do you release the resources. You need to get the uh, private sector to stop consuming. And so he said, one way is patriotic saving. And then, of course, you can have tax increases. You can have rationing. You can have wage and price controls and all that stuff to try to prevent inflation. So the big issue was fighting inflation. So when World War II hits, they're using the Keynes plan and the United States also adopted very similar strategies. So you try to get the population to save. You try to uh, postpone all the wage increases. So the government worked with private uh, firms and with labor unions to agree uh, to, to hold wages steady through the war when, of course, uh, we were way beyond full employment and workers could have demanded higher wages, we say, we're going to give you the reward at the end of the war. So it was really well understood that um, the government can't run out of money. Finding the money was not the problem. Finding resources was the problem. And that was understood. But in the 1960s, economists uh, and uh, maybe all of your, your viewers know this. But uh, economists tend to be very conservative, free market oriented, and anti-government. Uh, not all of them, of course, but the majority, especially in America and in Britain, 
what, what was called British political economy, uh, which then is moves over to the United States and becomes our our modern uh, new classical real business cycle theory, new monetary consensus, and all this. So it, it's the vast majority of the mainstream economists. They're all anti-government, and so what they did was they took the consumer budget constraint idea that's being taught in all of the microeconomics courses, the consumer faces a budget constraint, which of course is more or less reasonable in the case of a consumer. You can you know, spend your uh, wages or you can borrow, but you gotta be very careful about borrowing because you can get in trouble. They applied that to the government. That happened in the late 60s. There had never been this notion that there's a government budget constraint out there that's similar to a household budget constraint until the late 60s. So economists did that. And they convinced the politicians that just like a household, you got to balance your budget. Okay. Governments never behaved that way, um, except on gold standards. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, if you go back in time uh, to uh, uh, Britain, it, it it was common to, for the government to be in debt. In, in early America, in fact, our, the founding fathers understood it was good for the government to be in debt, that it was good for the population to hold government debt. So that's when it started to change. There was a reaction against so-called Keynesian economics and um, the budget constraint became uh, applied to government itself. This is fascinating. Do you think that it has something to do with this also ideological fight between capitalism and communism and the and the necessity to rein in the left? Because the left are those who say, like, just spend, just give people what they need. And you need a counter narrative in order to say, like, we don't have the money. We don't have the money, right? And that's the narrative we've got. And the funny thing is the narrative always like goes away or is on pause when it's when it comes to a military spending. We are these days, we are clearly military Keynesianists, right? But social... Uh... <laughs> What, what should we call them? Social uh, uh, austerity, yeah. <laughs> austerity yeah. fanatics. Austria. Um, do you think yes. it goes back to this one, the Cold War? Well, yes. Uh, now, in in um, Europe, the um, in general, the the social uh, welfare safety net was better, stronger than the United States. Um, at the end of the sixties. Uh, labor unions were stronger in general than they were in the United States. And it is possible that um, the inflation they started getting uh, was due to too much demand. And uh, so there's a reaction against that part, not against the military spending, of course, but a reaction against the welfare spending because they were getting um, uh, too much demand and a reaction against labor unions. They were uh, asking for wages that were too high and therefore they were getting some inflation. I think in the case of the United States, the same argue, arguments were made, but I think they were false for the US. Even though we were expanding the welfare system, we were fighting the, the Vietnam War. And so the uh, argument was, you know, the war on poverty and the war in Vietnam uh, was causing inflation, and that's why we had to rein in government spending. Um, I don't think it it was true. Our inflation uh, came later than in Europe. It was lower until OPEC quadrupled the price of oil. That's really what did it for the United States. That's where our high inflation came from. So I, I think they were pointing the finger at the wrong wrong place. It wasn't the welfare system. But yes, that opened up the possibility of blaming welfare. And then we had a, a very long period that um, finally climaxed with uh, Bill Clinton, who got rid of welfare. He ended welfare, uh, the welfare system in the United States, a Democrat. But uh, that was sort of the capping uh, that, uh, that whole um, era 
of a reaction against the welfare state. So um, fascinating. The under your breath earlier, you said you you were whispering gold standard, and um, I think that was a huge shift, wasn't it, when Nixon dissolved the gold standard? And in, in my mind, the monetary system in a gold standard, and then what came after, what was it, seventy two, seventy three are two different beasts. Is that correct? Like it, it, why was that such a fundamental shift? Yeah. Uh, let me just begin. Most people think that the gold standard was normal, that if you went back hundreds, even thousands of years, that gold was money and coins, the value of coins was determined by the quantity of gold in them and so on. This is just false. Uh, the gold standard uh, was mostly 19th century. Uh, countries went on and off gold. In bad times, they would always go off the gold standard. And then when they recovered, they try to go back on. It never lasted very long because the gold standard puts too much of a constraint on uh, government spending. Uh, and uh, it forces austerity on the country. The only way you can win on a gold standard is if you are an exporter. Uh, so that's why mercantilism was a very popular thing. Adam Smith wrote his book, 1776, against mercantilism. But the reason it was popular was because of the gold standard. So anyway, sort of ironically, the one exception where uh, the, uh, the currency was pegged to gold and then silver that lasted a really long time was Britain. So the UK uh, really did have a metallic uh, uh, standard and they kept the pound um, fairly uh, rigidly pegged to it for that entire period from Queen Elizabeth uh, until uh, they went off it in uh, the Great Depression. Um, so, no, nowhere else did you have such a long experience with the gold standard. So what I'm saying is it's it wasn't a normal thing except in England for 400 years. Okay, so that's where the idea came from, from them. Um, so all the countries went off the gold standard in the Great Depression. And I think there's a paper that shows the ones that went off earlier actually did better than the ones who went off later. So if you got went off early, you uh, didn't have such a bad experience. And, and then we went into World War II. So at the end of World War II, there's a meeting held at Bretton Woods in the United States. Uh, Keynes was a representative of England uh, to decide what kind of monetary set, uh, system we're going to have after World War II. Uh, and... Uh, they didn't want to go on to a gold standard because typically those only lasted one generation at most, and then the countries would go off. Um, Keynes was proposing a Bancor system in which you had this uh, international currency not linked to any particular country. So no particular country would get an advantage like the one that Britain had enjoyed before the war and like the one the US enjoyed after the war. Uh, but uh, Britain was too weak in the negotiations. The US got the system it wanted, which is that everyone is pegged to the dollar and the US promises to peg to gold. It worked okay, but it only worked for a generation, which is as long as they last. <laughs> um, by 19, uh, 19, early 1970s, there were far more dollar claims out in the world that could be converted to gold. Uh, by the way, Americans generally don't know this. Americans could not convert dollars to gold. So this is sort of a strange uh, gold standard. Only foreigners could convert uh, dollars to gold. But anyway, uh, in the early post-war period, the U.S., was the major exporter because industry was destroyed in Japan and in Europe. And so it worked out okay. 
uh, because the uh, countries needed the dollar to buy U.S. exports. So there was a big demand for dollars. By uh, the late 60s, there were lots of extra dollars out in the world and the U.S. was no longer the major exporter. We were losing our advantages to that as everybody recovered. And Nixon could see the, the writing on the wall and France sort of, I guess, de Gaulle, uh, sort of pushed it by threatening to convert all the dollars they had to gold. And so Nixon went off. And that was the end of the gold standard. We have just been on a floating exchange rate dollar standard uh, system ever since then. Um, second last question, a, a new change that is about to come is that the, at the moment, the only, the only um, um, central bank asset that we private people are allowed to own are banknotes and coins, right? That's the only central bank asset we can have uh, without going through one of the big institutions. But we there's a proposal on the table now to change that and actually also make digital currency directly issued by the central banks available to us. Do you think that this will have an impact on how the monetary system works or is it just a, a minor new form of asset? Um, well, it depends on... on uh exactly how it's implemented. So if every individual is going to have a deposit account at uh, the central bank, um, for me, that raises two, two questions. Uh, one is about um, privacy. So now the, the government directly uh, has information, your financial information. Um, or at least has access to it. Now they, they, they might try to enforce some kind of privacy and um, uh, I don't know how they would do that. The second one is, uh, how is that going to impact the banking system? If you look at what, what does a traditional bank do? I'm not talking about investment bank, Morgan Stanley or something like that, because they're in a different kind of business. Well, they issue deposits and they make commercial loans. So that's traditional banking. So they make loans to firms so that firms can buy the raw materials and pay wages to workers until they get the output and can sell it to get revenue. So you're creating deposits that uh, firms use to pay wages, and those wages are used to buy the output of firms. So there's sort of like a closed loop. It's financing the production and sale of consumer goods, mostly, uh, and other inputs to the production processes, okay? Well, what if uh, the, uh, the central bank becomes the issuer of deposits? What, how are, what kind of liabilities are the uh, commercial banks going to be issuing? The advantage of the um, uh, ha having control over the demand deposit system is it's a relatively cheap source of funds. Uh, today in the United States, demand deposits pay about zero. Um, and there's some costs of, you know, operating the teller and the uh, ATM machine and having a reasonably nice uh, lobby in the bank. Uh, but they've economized a lot on that by getting people to use their computers. <laughs> and never going to the bank, right? Uh, my college students have never seen a check before. They, they don't even know what they are, right? They do everything on their, uh, on their uh, watch. So uh, they, they've greatly reduced the costs of managing the deposit system. Uh, so how are they gonna, uh, what kind of liabilities will they issue in order to finance their position in commercial loans? Now, uh, Smaller banks still operate this way. The big banks, uh, Chase Manhattan and so on, uh, for them, it's much less of an issue because they, they're they involved in all sorts of things. Commer the commercial loan market can go away and probably won't affect them at all. What they do is securitize everything anyway, just put package securities and they sell them off to pension funds. But small smaller banks 
I don't know how this is going to impact them. So your worry is that CDBCs might put uh, smaller commercial banks out of business. And you know, I was I was at a at a um, meeting in here in in Tokyo uh, five six years ago, and one of the Swiss central bank governors was was here, and she was asked like, when are you finally going to do a CBDC uh, project? And she she said, look, this is this is delicate. We are not in that business. That's not our role, at least for now. That's what she meant, right? It's like it would be directly, the central bank would start directly competing with little local um, retail banks. I, th I think so. And, you know, I don't, it's hard for me to see the argument as to why we need this, because everything's digital now already. Yes. Um, so the arguments are, uh, one is, well, we're going to use blockchain. So you really do get privacy. Okay, fine. Uh, are you going to trust the central bank uh, to uh, not have some way to get in there? Um, because we know that blockchain actually is not completely opaque. The governments can get into there. Um, and the, the other argument, which I think is valid, is that uh, banks... Uh, discriminate against uh, especially really low-income people. So in the United States, we we used to have 25% unbanked uh, population. I don't know if it's still if that's still the right number or not. Uh, banks obviously prefer bigger deposits over tiny deposits um, because it's less costly to have one person who has a million dollar deposit versus a million people who have one dollar deposits. So uh, we have an unbanked population. My my alternative would be a postal saving system, which we had in the United States till 1965. Japan uh, had the biggest bank in the world was the Japanese Postal Savings Bank. Use the post offices, okay, and make it free and give people cards. Why do you need a central bank to do this stuff? You already have the post office everywhere. Uh, unfortunately, in the United States, we have been closing them partly because of President Trump when he was president. Um, so uh, reopen the ones we closed. Most people can walk or ride a bike to their post office. Give them a free account and let them do everything they can do at a bank. Uh, through the post office. And that that solves that problem, I think. I think it's a better solution than central bank. Uh, this is a fascinating discussion, and I would still like to continue this for quite a while, but um, we have to wrap it up. Um, where do you recommend people should go to find maybe your writing and in general to educate themselves about a realist way of looking at the economy? What's the best one-stop shop? Okay, well, uh, the Levy Institute uh, www.levy.org. I don't think that's the official one, but that will get you there. Uh, we have, I think, thousands of articles uh, uh, posted up there, different kinds, working papers, policy briefs, policy notes, one pagers. Um, many of those, most of those are on policy issues including MMT policies, but all kinds of policy issues. Uh, and a lot of those are written for general audience. Some of them are, are more technical. Um, and then for uh, MMT, you mentioned one of my books. Uh, there, For the really basic one, I have a, a cartoon book on MMT, Money for Beginners, that anyone can read. Uh, my uh, a uh, six-year-old daughter took it to the classroom to read um, and uh, can give a, an understanding of money. And then another one called um, uh, uh, Making Money Work for Us, which is aimed at, say, high school and above, high school and college uh, students or general population on MMT. Stephanie Kelton's book uh, is also... Um, uh, very simple for a general audience. And finally, let me just say, there is a documentary on MMT. It's called Finding the Money that uh, is now available for streaming. Uh, it's in English, but it's going uh, it's going to be dubbed 
very soon in Chinese and I don't know what other languages that um, is really fantastic. It's entertaining. It's completely accurate uh, on uh, the MMT view of the way things work. It's historical um, and uh, uh, really gives you a lot of information about the MMT view of the world. I will find that the link to this one and put everything into the description of this video. Everybody check it out. Um, Professor Larry Randall Ray, thank you very much for your time today. Okay, thank you. Thank you.